Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. Feel free to use the chat box for any questions. If we are unable to get to them during the presentation, they will be answered at the end. My name is Maddie Acey, and I will be your host for this webinar. Today, we will be pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be giving a presentation titled, Making the Most of MyHeritage.com. James Tanner has a bachelor's degree in Spanish and a master's degree in linguistics from the University of Utah. He received a Juris Doctor degree in law at Arizona State University. He served for two years as an intelligence analyst for the U.S. Army and 39 years as an Arizona trial attorney. He has previously owned a retail computer business and an Apple Macintosh software company. James has over 32 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star blog and rejoice and be exceeding glad. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa, Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. He has presented at expos and conferences around the U.S. and Canada. James has seven children and 33 grandchildren. Howdy. I'd like to welcome you today to another webinar from the Brigham Young University Family History Library. Um, I'd like to remind all the listeners that uh, these webinars are recorded and uploaded to the Brigham Young University Family History Library YouTube channel. That's the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. And uh, you can also subscribe to the, to the YouTube channel and uh, Google will send you a reminder of any uh, uh, videos that are uploaded. Uh, we're going to talk today about uh, making the most of my heritage. I'm uh, here. We have uh, the first question. Obviously, is what is my heritage? And um, getting an echo. Okay. Um, let's look at this. First of all, my heritage has more than 83 million registered members worldwide. Uh, on the program itself, they have a member map that I'll show you briefly here that uh, shows where all these members are. And uh, from uh, my heritage, I understand that they are now in every single country of the world. So this is a program that is uh, that basically throughout the world. Uh, it's not so well known in the United States as it is in many countries. And uh, I would suggest that uh, on this fact alone, it, it merits consideration. Uh, the number of names in the family trees on my heritage is 2.6 billion people. Now, the, the the thing with this program, and it differs from some of the other programs, in that each person has their own individual family tree. Uh, actually, you can have a number of family trees. You can do your family tree, you know, and any number of family trees on the program. Uh, there are some limits, but uh, most people are never going to run into those limits. Also, there are tw uh, presently 28 million family trees uh, on the program itself. With uh, And feeding into these family trees are uh, a huge database of historical records. These are original source records, including newspapers, books, uh, periodicals, um, vital records uh, from all over the world. Uh, and there are presently 6.8 billion historical records and documents supporting the, the um, information that's put into the family trees. As you'll find out, the program, as I go forward and discuss it a little, will uh, automatically look through all of these records for each of the people that you put in your family tree. Um, they have over 200 million photos on their website presently, and that number is growing um, extremely rapidly. Uh, it's the language is that the program itself is translated into 42 different languages from around the world. And um, as I mentioned, it has a geographic presence in all the countries in the world across all the continents. Uh, subscription plans. The way that this program works is the basic program is free. Uh, if you want to put up a limited family tree and uh, and use the program uh, to uh, to interact and, and 
look at the at what's online, uh, then it's free. The premium program adds uh, additional connection options with uh, with members of your family, adds uh, additional details to the program. Then there's a premium plus that gives you unlimited uh, capabilities with adding names to your family tree and doing some other things online. And then um, there are uh, as also what's called the data subscription. And the data subscription adds the automatic record searching capability uh, to the program. Uh, each of these uh, levels uh, have their own pricing structure. And uh, they change from time to time. The, the features are being added constantly. And so I would just suggest uh, investigating what uh, each level of the subscription plan brings and what it doesn't bring. And uh, obviously, from my standpoint, I would uh, recommend that, uh, that you get the entire program because of its benefits. And we'll see what, what those are as we go along. OK, so here's an introduction to the member map. This is um, when you look at the member map, which, by the way, is uh, sort of hidden down in their uh, media kit for, um, for news outlets and things like that. But the media, the media map will show, uh, by representing a little flag and the size of the flag, the number of users in any particular country. And uh, just offhand, for example, the flag that's showing there on England uh, is uh, represents 3.2 million uh, users in England. Uh, you'll notice also that there are flags on, on each of the countries in Europe, uh, particularly in Eastern Europe and places uh, like that. If we were to click on Asia and the other parts of the world, you'd see similar maps for those countries. Uh, so the total membership at the, at the point in time uh, that we were uh, that I did this presentation. It's probably just been a few days ago. Uh, was 83,676,576 users in this program um, during most of the past year? I've been watching this go up at about a hundred thousand users uh, a month. So it's uh, it it pretty well increases pretty rapidly. Um, one of the, the important things about the program from, for genealogical use, obviously, is not only the fact that it hosts uh, a, uh, a family tree where you can enter in your family tree data about your ancestors and, and uh, keep track of sources and all of the other things that go along with that in a, in a full-blown uh, uh, genealogical program, but uh, the key to the, to the uh, importance of, of my heritage to genealogical researchers is the fact that these entries that you put into your family tree, if you enter an individual, for example, your great-grandfather or your great-great-grandfather or whatever, great-great-grandmother, then the program automatically begins searching for records based on the information that you've put into the family tree. Uh, this automatic searching program is called Super Search. And uh, it, it, is a, uh, it, it examines each of those records uh, now you can <clears throat> that are in your family tree. Now, you can go into the program and research. Um, there are lots of other online databases where you go in and you put in your name and you put in your, uh, the name you're searching for and some information. Then the program sends out its search engine and searches records and brings back the results. Well, the answer is uh, family. Uh, My Heritage will do that. My Heritage, you can go to the research section, you can enter names into the program, and it will do the search. But by and large, uh, the the idea of the program is that you put your family tree into the program, and then let the program do the searching. Uh, my experience over the last few years with the program is that. Uh, their ability to find the records, the, the program uh, programmer's ability to do their search is called super search, and its ability to find records for your fa for your family members is far more convenient, uh, far more accurate, and a lot faster than you can possibly do any of the research. So, uh, my 
kind of recommendation is put your family tree into MyHeritage and let the program do the searching and then uh, process the records that are found by the program. Um, so here's where the records are and this was Welcome to Cir uh, Super Search and if you look at that you'll see the 6.8 billion records and that number will go up uh, uh, over, uh, actually it goes up uh, as they add new databases uh, in a large increments, so it can uh, stay the same for a while and then jump a really large number as they add up add records to the program. And we'll look at some of the newer records that they've added uh, that will be of great uh, interest to <clears throat> the genealogy, uh, genealogical community. Okay, so how does it work? So here's a, a, a screenshot of uh, the family tree. Now, one of the things I mentioned to uh, more traditional genealogists from the United States, particularly, is that uh, the family tree view in MyHeritage uh, is something, sometimes a little bit different than what you're used to. This isn't the uh, standardized pedigree view of, uh, of, your, of your ancestry that you may be used to looking at. Now, the, pr the problem is that they're addressing a uh, a group of people of 83 million people spread across the world whose expectations in looking at a pedigree chart are significantly different than what we're used to. Uh, my experience in teaching uh, genealogy over the years, for someone who just walks in who hasn't really got any background at all in doing research in, in historical records or genealogy or anything, and if you hand them the standard pedigree chart view of of, uh, of how we're going to lay out their ancestry. I've had people look at it and say, what's this? And I say, well, it's, it represents a family tree. And I say, right here on the top goes your father, and here goes your mother. And they say, well, why does the father go there and the mother go there? And I say, well, that's just the way it's done. Well, where am I? Well, you're over here on the beginning of the chart. Well, this kind of dialogue just goes on, and it realized, made me understand and realize that most people have no idea what, how to represent their family relationships. So this chart is quite simple. The people are on the chart. There are lines that go from children to parents. There are connecting lines from parents to their spouses, and to individuals to their spouse or their spouses. And if there are multiple spouses, they're shown. If there are multiple marriages, they're shown. If there's other relationships, they're all shown on the chart. So everything sort of comes out uh, with lines and, and uh, di on this diagram. Um, uh, the good news is that you don't really need to do a lot of work from, of your work from the family tree. Most of the program is geared to doing the work from uh, the menus and the, and the program itself rather than referring back to your family tree all the time. But it is always nice to have sort of a graphic design here showing. Not all the tree appears on the screen. You can shrink it down. You can expand it. And if you expand it far enough, then there's a, um, a little navigating uh, aid that appears in the lower uh, left-hand side of the screen that lets you get an overview of the family tree and shows you where you are if you get lost for any, re for any reason. OK. So the point here is that MyHeritage is not a static research site. You need to have a family tree so the program can help you find your sources and your relatives. So this is, uh, it's a dynamic uh, program that uh, interacts with you and your usage of the program and then uh, aids you by helping you and giving you suggestions at a very high degree of accuracy of records that might help you uh, extend your family tree. One of the most uh, interesting parts of the program is, is the instant discoveries. In this case, what, what uh, MyHeritage has done is compiled a large enough database that uh, a significant number of people who sign on to the program for the first time uh, will, will have uh, what, we, what are basically um, instantaneous uh, connections to a large number of people. So understanding how this works when somebody first signs into the program in, in many, many cases. Not, it's not universal. Not everyone has 
relatives uh, in places where the records are even available. So if, you're, if your family comes from uh, uh, Belarus or from uh, uh, Latvia or Lithuania or uh, someplace like that, uh, Malaysia or someplace, uh, don't expect uh, any of these programs, online programs, to pop in your ancestors automatically. This is not there. We just haven't reached that level of, of penetration with the databases. But in this case, when a person signs into uh, MyHeritage for the first time, the program asks some basic information. It asks for your parents' names and some basic information about birth places and dates. And then it asks for your grandparents' names and some basic information about places and dates. Uh, that's both sets of grandparents, your maternal and paternal grandparents. So that's a total of six people in addition to yourself. And then it does a little bit of calculating. And uh, in most cases that I've seen uh, here in the United States, I'm going to have to qualify that, and also among all the people that I know, uh, many of whom have, who have nothing at all on uh, any genealogy program have, have seen people, have seen as many as 50 or 60 relatives pop in instantaneously. So this is, a, you know, it's just amazing. It is it's almost overwhelming. In fact, if you go to the MyHeritage YouTube channel, uh, you can watch uh, the reactions of people as they do this instant discoveries. Now, this other additional part of here is the instant, instant discoveries portion of the program is once you have your database, your, your family tree in the program, the program then will go out and it will match the the individuals in your family tree to those individuals in everyone else's family tree. And if someone has put sources in and verified a relationship uh, to someone who matches someone in your family tree, then MyHeritage will come back and give you what are called instant discoveries. It'll say, we have found, in this case, 12 additional people who uh, have been verified by others with sources to have been connected to this person who's in your family tree. So you can see, uh, and these instant discoveries go on constantly. You can just have, all of a sudden, you'll get a note that's from my heritage that said we found an additional 20 people or 15 people or new people for your family tree. And, and the accuracy uh, is, is very accurate. Now, there's a limitation on all these programs, whether you're using my heritage or uh, family search or find my past or ancestry, whatever program you're using, uh, on, with an online <clears throat> family tree, if the information that you supply initially is not accurate, if you put in the wrong grandparents, for example, or great grandparents, or great great grandparents, the program's going to assume that they need to look for those grandparents, and then you'll be on your way to having some inaccurate information. Now, the problem is this: is that uh, the the program may very well come back and suggest that the information that you have supplied is wrong. But if you don't notice it or you don't follow up with it and correct what you have. So for example, you might name your great-grandfather, whose name might be very common, like Tom Smith or something like that in, the, in English, or Jose Gonzalez in Spanish or you know whatever, in whatever language, the common name. Uh, the name may be the same, but you may have completely wrong information about this individual. And that can throw off these family trees because they will begin searching for the inf based on the information you have supplied. So what's important here is the source component, where you look at the records that are supplied and correct constantly correct the information in your family tree to conform to the records that you find. Now, as recently as yesterday, I was working with a family tree on one of the major websites and uh, found uh, someone who had, uh, who had a record attached to their person with a birth date that was different than the one that they showed in their main details about that individual. So the ability to continue to, to work with these programs is based uh, in part and significantly in part on our own personal ability to utilize the data that is supplied to us. Okay, so once we get this basic information, then the program takes off, and you may be surprised 
by the number of people that are added to your family tree. Uh, when I have introduced this with people, um, I've personally experienced uh, the impact that this has. I have seen people so surprised that they basically stood up and danced around, literally, and I have seen other people who have burst into tears because they had no idea that they were related to that many people. So, I mean, it's just, uh, it, it can be a very emotional experience. Um, and once they start suggesting these new uh, connections and sources, they'll continue to do that constantly with the program. Okay, so super search uh, is the, the, what they call their, their um, program that's, that's driving all of these, um, all of the things that happen with the program. And it's a, basically an advanced searching technology with a very high degree of accuracy. When this was, when this was first introduced a few years ago, um, and when the, uh, the additional things that we'll talk about were introduced by MyHeritage, it created a ripple effect among all of the other uh, online databases. Uh, they immediately had to uh, increase their degree of accuracy because they uh, had a demonstration here that it could be done, and it could be done at a very high degree of accuracy. Okay, so the first level, and what you'll probably see most commonly as you uh, put your family tree into MyHeritage, are smart matches. Now, I characterize, this isn't necessarily MyHeritage's characterization, but my characterization of smart matches is an invita are invitations to connect with, with um, people who are uh, very likely your relatives. So if you, um, this, this, this is kind of an interesting situation because you may, may or may not have a need to talk to your relatives. Um, uh, many people are thrilled and overcome with the idea that they can find people that they're related to. Uh, some of us who have, uh, for instance, right now, uh, I have over 100,000 smart matches. There's no way in the universe I'm going to talk to 100,000 people. Um, and uh, I don't know how to pick which ones I want to start talking to if you really want to know the truth. Uh, but the idea here is that, uh, for example, and let me give you an example of a person who would use a smart match. Uh, let's suppose that one of these people, that your family came from one of these places I mentioned uh, in Eastern Europe or some other part of the world. Um, and uh, if that were the case, then learning of a relative and having a contact with a relative who was in the country where your ancestors came from, who spoke the language and was interested in genealogy would be an extremely important thing. And what I have found in talking to people is that they are absolutely um, overjoyed with the with the contacts that they've obtained through um, through my heritage. So what this is is a unique technology that intelligently matches your family tree to hundreds of millions of profiles in other family trees. So that what you get is a suggestion saying that this person in your tree matches this person in someone else's family tree. And these smart matches for me, with all the numbers of the large number of people I have in my family tree and the large number of potential relatives I have uh, because of my particular family, uh, I get notifications almost daily of additional smart matches. So this is a, a, a fabulous technology that lets us to do. Uh, and once again, I'd uh, emphasize that smart matches are an invitation to connect and if you don't want to connect or if you have no reason to connect with the people, then there's no, no basic reason. It doesn't add anything particularly to your program except give you a lot more email to connect with all of these extra people. So uh, it, it's part of the program that can be used as a tool, but it's not, a, a, it's not necessary to use the tool continually. And uh, if, you don't, if you don't interest it in that particular aspect, then it then you can uh, leave it alone. Okay, so you watch for smart matches. And as those come in, you'll see them down here on your startup page. And this is a screenshot of my startup page, which will look similar to what your 
a home page or startup page will look like when you go into the program. Uh, there's a lot more information here on this page and uh, we'll look at, at more of the things that have. So right now, for example, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, looking at my smart matches, it's inviting me to, to review more than 100,000 matches. So I've apparently maxed out on their smart matches number. Um, now, when you look at your family tree itself, you're going to see this kind of a, of a little uh, uh, icon patch, uh, badge or whatever for each of the individuals uh, in your tree. And there's going to be certain things on this badge that tell you uh, information about the person. The name, obviously, uh, the birth date, the fact that there's no death date known. Uh, you'll see across the upper left-hand corner a black band that tells you that that person is deceased. Um, if there's no black band, the computer program thinks the person's alive. You may want to make sure that you've got all your ancestors who really are deceased, deceased. And I always suggest people don't try to kill off your living ancestors by marking them deceased in your genealogy program. So, you know, that does happen occasionally. Um, one thing is right here is uh, an indication that this person has smart matches. So I'll get back to that. I jumped ahead a little too quick. Uh, so that little green, the one below it is going to talk about record matches, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But there are some other things on this family tree. Uh, if I were to spend time uh, telling you how the whole program operated in detail on how to, how to run the program, uh, then it would take much more time. In fact, I, I attempted to do that with an earlier um, webinar this uh, uploaded video that I did in a class classroom and it took three parts uh, so it was uh, quite a long video uh, so we're going to kind of skip over a little bit of this today just a couple of mention the plus sign below lets you add people who are related to this person to Elizabeth Ann, Catherine, Pilly and the little rabbit ears up in the corner the, re the blue and pink uh, rabbit ears are uh, to let you extend the family tree from this person what you see in a family tree is really kind of a collapsed version, and you can just click on those little rabbit ears to expend, extend the tree on that individual. And then in addition to that, there's sort of a white pencil down in the right-hand corner, and that's to edit the information that's there. So the family tree is, is pretty straightforward. Now, the process when you review and, and confirm a smart match. If you go through the smart match and it says uh, view information and then it'll ask you to confirm that smart match, then confirming the smart match lets you contact relatives directly through the program. Uh, so in a sense, in a real sense, in fact in an intentionally done real sense, uh, MyHeritage is a social networking program for genealogy. So you're able to, um, to use this program to contact relatives around the world in the United States or elsewhere um, directly through the program. So if I wanted to uh, connect with this person, if you look at this, it says that there's another website out there called the Anderson Family website, and the person who has that website is listed. And it says there are 36 matches between my website and this website. So if there's 36 people we have in common, uh, there's probably a fairly high, high possibility that this person is one of my relatives. Uh, if we had one person in common, that might be the fact, uh, it would depend on whether I, was, I had accurately put the right person in my Fitch family tree as to whether we were connected. But when we get up to like 36 matches, then it starts to begin to uh, indicate that we, we share this part of, the, of, uh, of our relatives. Okay, now we're going to move on now um, to record matches. Now this is an indifferent subject altogether. Here we're not talking about family trees. We're not talking about information. Let me mention this, that the smart matches connect you with the people, but they don't necessarily uh, allow you to move information from one family tree to another uh, unless you want to collaborate with the people who are on uh, that you're talking to. In other words, there's a way in which you can share uh, 
ownership of your family tree and let people in to uh, who can help you edit and add information and do things with your family tree if you want to create a, a research group or whatever with family members or others. And so uh, that's, that's not the, where you're going to pick up the records for your uh, members of your family, the people in your family tree. The record matches is the technology that's going out and searching all of those um, billions of records and making and giving you record hints, matches, record matches between your, the members of your family tree, individuals in your family tree, and the records that are out there. And I might mention that that's, uh, the, the technology was uh, surprisingly accurate. When it was introduced, and, and uh, I would tell people in groups that uh, uh, my heritage was making uh, record matches at about 98% accuracy, I would get sort of disbelief looks and, and comments and all sorts of things about how that was probably not even possible. And then after uh, time passes, now we're years down the road from that introduction. And uh, now when I mention it, people say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's very accurate. <laughs> so we don't, have to, we don't have to worry about the arguments back then that, that were occurring about the accuracy of these programs. And, and like I mentioned earlier, they've, they've sort of dragged all the other programs into being more accurate than they were previously. Uh, so record matches are historical records, such as birth, marriage, death, census, and all sorts of other records. And they're separate from the smart matches that are found in, in other, other individuals' uh, family tree, of individuals that are found in other family trees. So you're not matching people to people, you're matching people to records. And the program automatically matches uh, the individuals in your family tree with all of the records on the website. So it's doing this constant searching and you'll get additional record matches. Every time they add new records, then you're obviously going to get a lot of new record matches. Every time you add new people, then you're going to get new record matches. So every, every time this, this is a process that just continually happens. Now what I was, initially what I would tell people is uh, just some time ago and my, my views on how the program works have evolved over time and continue to change and evolve as other things happen and as they introduce more information. Originally what I suggested to people was because of one factor. I'm not sure how accurate the information you have in your family tree already is. So rather than dump a lot of in, in a, incorrect information into MyHeritage, I would suggest that you start out with a few people that you're, you know, have well sourced and well documented and then allow the program to find additional sources and add people by uh, from the sources that you that the program finds. Um, you can build a family tree uh, in most cases and some there's always exceptions every time I make a generalization somebody always comes up and says well I never found anything and usually what happens uh, from my own experience is that the information they have put in the tree is incomplete uh, initially, when they were talking about this, I would find that people marked everybody private, and so it would basically stop the program from doing anything. <laughs> so basically, you know, you just gotta, you've got to, to deal with, with reality here that, that, and allow the program to do what it does very well. Okay, so let's look at some examples of what we're talking about when we're talking about record matches. Um, in this case, the one of the records that I just brought up for one of the for one of my people is, is a record match comes from a compilation of public source published sources. This is a newer database, one that just been put into the, the program, and uh, it looked through 91 million pages in 440 447,000. 870 sources. Okay, so here's what what uh, um, MyHeritage did. Uh, MyHeritage reviewed, uh, had people, you know, people with their company review uh, published sources, books. We're talking about books and, and magazines, serials, journals, uh, publications to determine whether or not they were genealogically significant. In other words, if they contained information that could be 
um, used by genealogists to, uh, to discover their families. Uh, they selected, uh, beginning last year, that would be year 2015, uh, they selected uh, a, a group of people who reviewed these, and once they had the, the documents reviewed, they put the, the entire uh, document online, the books and other, other publications online, which had been completely read by the computer through um, optical character recognition or OCR software. Then they used the super search program that we've talked about, plus other enhancements of the program, to read through the entire text of all of these magazine books and records books. And they put up, initially they put up 47,000. And then the, the program would then take those records, look through all of, the rec, all of those books, and pick up all of the names and match them to your family. But they didn't just do the names. What they would do, in essence, is create a pedigree of the names found in the book and match that to your pedigree. So if, if the, the book said, uh, Tom Jones married Mary Smith, and Mary Smith's parents were so-and-so, and Tom Jones' parents were so-and-so, and they had five children, and these are the names of the children, then they would take all of that information and match it to your tree, so the accuracy level became much and much much greater. So that was the, the amount of data that was incorporated. And so by creating this model, of, as you, if you were, or analog of what, of what was in the what's in the book, taking the information in the book, creating a model of the analog of it of a family, then matching that family out to your family tree, then all of this information then comes across with a higher degree of accuracy. Now, so what they're doing in essence is reading. Then, uh, then earlier this year in 2016, they kicked the number up to 447,000 plus volumes of books. So they're essentially reading. A half, almost a half a million books all the way through, cover to cover, every single word, and pulling out all the genealogical information that could be used for your family. Okay, so if I spent the rest of my life pulling volumes of books off the library shelves here in the BYU library, I would never get to 400,000. So it, it's just, and, and I would have to read every single line of every book in order to do what they're doing. So this is just an uh, unbelievable step uh, the, adva the, the advance in this is just overwhelming. Now, yeah, you can go into MyHeritage and search that database. Or you can not waste your time and you can let them search the whole thing for you and, and bring all the record hints and give you all the record hints. So, you know, you can make your choice. It depends on what you want to do. Okay. So if I look at that, here it is. So here's my ancestor, John Sutton Linson, and he is featured in a book called Pioneers and Prominent Men of Utah, a 19th print published back in 1913. His name's highlighted right there, and that's him, and it tells you his biography. Now, I, I conceivably could have thought, well, my Linton family people were pioneers. They might have been in a book called Pioneers and Prominent Men of Utah, but I'd have to know the book exists, or I'd have to go research and find out that it exists. Then I'd have to find a copy of the book, and then I'd have to look through and look up and see if that had anything about all my ancestors. Or I could put my ancestors in my heritage and let them do it all for me. Okay, so, I mean, think about it. So nearly half a million books completely read and searched for your ancestors. And uh, the indications are that they will probably add a, a, a significant number of books to this, to this online collection. So after you found, they found one of these sources for you, after they've gone search through and they found a book or they found a vital record or whatever has been found, then it's up to you to evaluate that source. So I need to look at this, and I need to determine, is this my person? Now, uh, the accuracy is very high, but in the, in the long run, people have very similar names and can have extremely uh, nearly identical appearance names and siblings and everything else. And so there is no real... Um, 
substitute for sitting down and looking carefully at the records and making sure that the records are uh, correct. So you review the match and you have to check it off or you can exit out. If it's the wrong person, which does happen, then you just click the X and then you're not bothered with that research, doing that research again. In addition, the program learns. It says, oh, by the way, that wasn't a correct match, so therefore it goes away. Now, here's one of the problems with the program. That not really a problem with the program, it's more a problem with the people who use the program. They will start to think that, oh, I have too many of this. I don't need that source. Uh, I've already got 15 sources for my guy. I'm tired of this, so I'm just going to X all these out. Well, now what you've told the program is these are all wrong. So now it's not going to do its job because it's, you've been told that, oh, even though it thinks that it's correct, you've told it it's wrong. So just go through and click the, X, the check marks if it's the same person. Okay, then you can you attach the, the after it's been evaluated and you've confirmed the identity, you get another page with more information and more details. And then that lets you go through that information and verify and hit the confirm button down there at the bottom right that tells the the program to uh, add that as a source to your individual in your family tree and also um, confirms that that's correct so that more records can be found. Now, once you do that with this record hints, record matching program that gives you all these record hints, then there's a new program that just was developed in the last few months called the Record Detective 2. Well, Record Detective was an innovation that was added on to the record matching program. In that case, the Record Detective program took some of the information from the records that you confirmed and went out and looked for additional records for the people in those records. Well, they've expanded on that recently to what's now called Record Detective 2, but it doesn't show up in the program as anything different. But then what happens is that as you bring up a record that they now know is the record for that person, whether or not you confirm it, because they have a very high degree of confidence in their own program, they give you additional records for each of the records that you find. So even though I have thousands of, of records sitting out there waiting for me to process, if I process one of those records, the record detective may possibly bring up many, many more, even dozens more records pertaining to that family and that individual. So in this case, with this person, uh, John Sutton Lytton, I just told this, the program by opening that up that I probably thought that was the right person and I could click the confirm. But even before I did that, this, the program had also found related records about John Sutton Linton and his family members, an additional 21. Now, up until recently, until they in, introduced this record detective, uh, Roman numeral two or number two, advanced part of this program, uh, the highest number of, of additional sources that I saw uh, was about actually around 99. And that may have been some limit on the program itself. I don't know that, but <clears throat> that was always there. Now that this one has come up, the, the highest number I've seen now is 240-something. I think it was 247 additional records for one person from one click. So, uh, you know, sometimes the information here is overwhelming, I, just really. So all these additional sources are suggested automatically. Now, when you go through the process of looking at the record, then you uh, confirm it, then it will suggest you want to add this record as a source to your people, which you do. And then it pulls up every member of the family who's mentioned in that record and allows you to, to evaluate, go through, and add in any additional or new or updated information that's found in the record. So if you've been looking for a birth record and all of a sudden it finds some record of the birth, then it will let you correct the information in your file 
automatically by clicking the, the arrows moving information between the left hand side of the screen and the right hand side of the screen. Now, uh, some people mention that, oh, this is all reversed. It, it's different than the way that we look at it. And I might mention that I haven't mentioned before that the program was developed in Israel. It's, it comes out of a small town outside of Tel Aviv, Israel, sort of a suburb. And um, so in Hebrew, they read from right to left instead of from left to right. So some of the screens you're going to see <laughs> seem exactly the opposite of what you're used to. They, I think they're trying to do that, but I don't think they have any way to correct that because there are other languages that read from right to left instead of left to right. So they, they kind of have to be kind of arbitrary because they're in 42 different languages, so they can't, they can't fiddle around with this stuff too much. But, uh, you know, give them some slack, folks, because they're, uh, they're trying to do all this in Hebrew. Okay, now this brings up another question, <laughs> of course. Uh, since they have this, this program in 42 different languages, uh, then we have uh, a new technology that was introduced to this in, within the last year or so, and that's the global name translation technology. Now, what this technology does is it takes the name that you enter in your language, whatever it is, any one of those 40 languages or so, 40, language, 40 or so languages, and translates that name into its equivalent in all the other language, in, in a number of the other languages, and it always it, they're increasing that all the time. So, for example, if my ancestor's name was Jacob Schmidt, then it would translate that into Hebrew or Russian or um, English or whatever German or French or Spanish or whatever language that uh, was out there. So the translation not only translates it, then it starts doing searches using all of the translated names. So when you have your ancestor who was in the United States, and then it will look for the variations of that name in German or Russian or Ukrainian or whatever language that, that's out there. Finding those, it will bring out those as record matches if, if, if there are any records available for that individual. When you start seeing this, it's it's starts getting a little bit spooky actually because it does stuff that you couldn't believe. Uh, the other thing that it does is it puts in all of the variations of the name. So for example, if your uh, ancestor's name was Elizabeth, it make, it'll look for Betty, Beth, Eliza, um, you know, anything, any other name that's out there that's a variation of that name. And these are they're constantly adding to these databases so that the information is more accurate and searches more completely in the records. So it's pretty hard to hide from a, a search for this for this program. So it automatically translates the names found in the historical records and family trees from one language to another at a very high degree of accuracy. And here's the ones they've they've got so far, English, German, Dutch, French, Spanish, Catal Catalan, Portuguese, Italian, Norwegian, Swedish, Danish, Greek, Hebrew, Polish, Czech, Russian, and Ukrainian. And they're going to add more, and they are in the process of adding more languages. Now, <clears throat> next thing is super search alerts. Um, what this does is it tells you, this is a, this is a, a very new program um, within the last few months, and basically what it said was this. They recorded all of your searches. Now, don't be surprised. There's lots of companies out there that record everything you ever do. Try, try working with Amazon, and you remember that they will have give you a database of everything you've ever bought from Amazon, including everything from diapers to, you know, whatever you buy, watches or whatever. Okay. So don't be surprised. But now what they've decided to do is this. If you've made a search and now they've added a record, which you were previously searching for that name and they find the name in that new record, they will send you a notice that says, we found this person in a new record. So even though you've, you searched like six months ago or a year ago for somebody, all of a sudden, you'll get a note that says, oh, by the way, you searched for John Jones a year ago, and now we found even a new record we just added. So 
It now notifies you when new results are available from your previous searches on SuperSearch that did not exist when you first searched. So you're accumulating all your searches in MyHeritage over time. And as you do that, it'll just keep going and searching and searching and searching for everybody you've ever searched for. Okay, now this is kind of the, the piece de resistance of the uh, of uh, the my heritage lately. This is the latest uh, great new, uh, new and great thing. Uh, you, this is one part. This is one. This is called pedigree map, and it it came out. To, interesting thing. This is something I think that's interesting about my heritage. I mean, it's just kind of a comment on the side, but it's an interesting thing. These people don't tell anybody what's going on. I mean, they do. They have a blog and they send out notices and I get emails and whatever, but they're not like, uh, you know, putting it on TV and setting up rockets and having, you know, um, fireworks shows and things about their, their, uh, their new, new uh, developments because they just keep kicking them out. I mean, they did. They'd be in a constant state of, of, of you know, having a party. So it's about time. So they just keep business as usual and start kicking this stuff out. Uh, this one happened to slip out. Uh, and uh, it shows up under the app menu on, uh, if you look at your screen, there's uh, My Heritage and Home and Family Tree, Discoveries, Photos and Apps. And if you click, you'll find this added on. It's called Pedigree Map. It just came in. It's a, to all the users. It wasn't any kind of an upgrade or anything. You just basically showed up. Okay. So this, this, this basically what this does is it, it, involves the user in what's called cluster research. Now, you know, I don't want to sound like, uh, you know, an exclusive, some kind of exclusive or high level or whatever. But basically, this is, this is a, um, and, and I don't want to use the word advanced, because it's, it is advanced, but it's, it's what you call a very, uh, a very sophisticated, uh, and I have to use the word high-end level of research that most of us, after doing research for years and years and years and studying and going to classes and learning and trying to figure out how to do stuff, end up doing this. We end up looking geographically at all the places where our ancestors lived to see if there's consistency and to see if there are connections and see who we have in certain areas. And I have been plotting my people on maps for years. I have been, for years, I have been looking and plotting my people. Now, this is not just another map program. Uh, I can go on to any number of programs right now that will show me where my ancestors came from. And they'll show me that I have these people from England, or I have these people from uh, Denmark, or I have these people from Ireland, or wherever else I have people coming from. So what's the difference here? What did they do? Well, OK. So I have thousands of people in my family tree. And in those thousands of people, I have thousands of events in their lives. They have taken every event on every person on my family tree and put them on a map. Now, I can zoom in on that. And it will show me every photo and event grouped by country and location, allowing you to filter the map to view it by person, family group, event type, and time period. So I can take all the information I have. They, I, they have done this. They, all the information in my family tree is now mapped and filter. I can filter it to look where all the people lived, where the family groups were, where the event types were, where everybody was born, where everybody was christened, where everybody died. And I can go in by time period, and I can look at any area down to the parish level in England, down to the county level in the United States, down to the city level down to all over the world. So they've, they've married this huge database of geographic information with all the information in your family tree and let you and automatically mapped every event across the world. So I can, I can zoom in on a county in England and I can go down to the parish level and click on that parish and have a list of every person in my database that comes up in that parish. And that's the kind of thing that I took me hours previously to, to work through. And I can also see 
immediately on the map where everybody lives in the same area and where they are. So every little place that I've indicated comes up as a, as a dot location on the map, and then I can just click and see who lives there. And so here's what it looks like when I uh, zoom in a little bit on England. And on the right hand, left hand side are all of the, uh, all of the places that I've uh, mentioned. The right hand side are more detail about the places. When I zoom in, then I can see more information about each individual person and family on where they live. And so it enables you to do some complex location and, uh, analysis and cluster research to show where groups of your ancestors may have come from. Um, they have an enhanced photo gallery. Um, this is moving on to another program. Um, in the photo gallery, uh, pulls in photos uh, from all of the family trees that are related to your family tree. Uh, it allows you to see uh, where that came from uh, and to do some editing and comment on it and also tells you who had the photo and the details and any keywords and notes and links to any of the uh, photos that you want to make. Uh, in other words, uh, it develops a rather sophisticated database for managing your photos and attaching them to your family tree and letting people see, uh, other people see what you have in the way of photos. So you can tag and comment on the photos and you can add videos, by the way. Uh, one of the other new innovations on the program is called a sun chart. Uh, it looks like a fan chart in a sense, but a fan chart was a fan, so it was only half of a circle. A sun chart is a complete 360 degree circle of your family with whoever you want in the middle. And then this is, uh, they have a whole selection of charts that you can print and, and uh, very interesting. These are complete detailed charts. So the main person is the middle, is in the middle, and then the surrounding are the descendancy, including the photos of the individuals where, where they're available. Um, there's also a section on charts and books, and you can uh, create a whole bunch of different um, customized charts. Uh, there's a long list that I'd suggest you might want to explore in addition to the new one, the sun chart. So these are the lists. They have a bow tie, the close family, ancestors, descendants, an hourglass, sun chart, fan chart, and an all-in-one chart. So these are the, the basic uh, things from the thing. They also create a family book with charts. Uh, you can design what you want the book to say, and uh, it will print that out for you. Um, one of the other new innovations uh, that came up with MyHeritage is called the MyHeritage Community. This is a, uh, in essence, uh, I think they call it a community. I think in the past we would have probably called it a forum or a bulletin board or whatever else we wanted to call it, but it is actually a place where you can post and ask questions and get into discussions and, and interact with other people that are around the world. Um, uh, it, it has the same limitations as any other uh, forum or online community. I mean, you can post a question that nobody will look at. One of the interesting things about the questions that are posted that I say that nobody would look at for a long period of time uh, however, as uh, we've learned as posting things online, sometimes it takes a, a considerable time, and I've had it happen for years. We've posted things online, questions that we didn't have an answer to, and had uh, many years, two or three years later, had people come up and answer the questions for us. So we're, you know, we're uh, kind of a proponent of having a, a, a bulletin board community type thing where people can talk. And they have basically a questions and answer hub for the users to collaborate and help each other. Okay, well that sort of covers what we had about MyHeritage today. Um, I hope that uh, you'll realize that these, are, uh, these webinars are sponsored by the Brigham Young University Family History Library on the campus of Brigham Young University, which has a few thousand people here today walking around and parking lots full, but it's uh, an interesting place nonetheless. And remember that these are all, uh, will be posted on the BYU uh, Family History Library YouTube channel and encourage you to subscribe 
uh, to that channel. Thanks again for watching.